Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Harold, and I am Siegfried's younger brother. I have a few things to say to introduce myself and my purpose, and these are important to your experience of the video and understanding my place on this channel. So I would appreciate it if you didn't skip the introduction. Nevertheless, timestamps are below. This past summer, when Siegfried presented to us the creation of his channel, I was surprised at all the different ideas he had. Among them was one idea that struck me in particular. It was rather vaguely worded as a channel about storytelling. Now, when I saw that, I suggested that this should be what he should do. And after a few minutes of further discussion with our youngest brother Leif, he agreed. And yet, now that I look at his channel, I find that he has only posted a few videos attempting to balance storytelling with his other obligations. However, all he has done with the channel, and all he seemingly ever wants to do with it, is to have it be an assortment of narrations he's done for stories he's written. This is both boring and not what I wanted. In our discussion, I thought we had decided that his goal should be to change the culture as it exists on the internet into one which is more conducive to having good discussions about stories, as well as to help people understand the importance of good storytelling. But no, I was wrong apparently. He didn't want to do any of that, and instead is unwilling to even challenge the terrible state of qualitative analysis on the internet, and I must be left to bemoan my impotence in the onslaught of terribly argued review after terribly argued review. That is, unless I join the fray. Did I sound pretentious there? Sorry, this whole series is going to be me criticizing internet critics, and sometimes I feel the need to get into the mindset of those I criticize. Anyway, this was originally going to all be one video, but as it grew bigger I thought it would be better to divide it into sections, so that it's not just one massive six hour long video from some random newbie YouTuber that no one is going to watch. The subject I'd first like to talk about is subjectivity and objectivity in relation to art and criticism. And since I do not wish to draw all the pictures that would be required for a video this long, I will instead be playing footage from a nearly closeless run of The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, which you are seeing on screen right now. And now, on to the video. To make things clear from the start, it is my position that criticism necessarily falls within the realm of objectivity. And that the realm of subjectivity should only be brought up as an example for how the objective quality of a given work of art can affect people's enjoyment of it. This is not to say that discussion of taste, subjective reviews, or even first impressions are inherently bad. All of those things are fine in their own context. Rather, what I mean to say is that when one sits down to assess something's quality and to make a judgment about it, that is, what it does well and what it does poorly, one can only do so by making objective statements about objective reality. This has apparently become a controversial opinion, as it seems relatively ubiquitous for critics to be of the opinion that the second one starts talking about something's quality, your criticism ceases to be objective and moves into the realm of subjectivity. Now, there are some critics who have dissented from the consensus view, but few of them have attempted to demonstrate why it is we can judge art objectively instead preferring to simply demonstrate the ridiculousness of the subjectivist position. And that is fine as far as it goes, however, I would like to demonstrate both what it means for art's quality to be objective, and give my arguments for the basis by which we can assess this. And this brings me to my first point. If you are at all familiar with the present debate, you will have likely heard all sorts of contradictory statements about these two words. Whether it be that objective means an assessment of the bare facts, like this drawing is mostly green, or Luke Skywalker is the protagonist. Whereas subjective means things like the Mona Lisa is good, or the Last Jedi is terrible. Or you may have heard that objective means an assessment of plot holes and logical inconsistency as it relates to stories. Or that subjective means that one is simply talking about their own personal outlook or their own personal taste, and it's just my opinion. All of these are either wrong or just simply do not capture what the actual words mean. Rather, subjective is an adjective which, when applied to statements or opinions, indicates that the statement is describing reality as it is perceived. In other words, it is talking about the subject of the statement. Whereas objective indicates that the statement is attempting to describe reality as it actually is, independent of anyone's perception. This is why criticism must be objective in nature, since criticism is a statement about a work of art, specifically about what it does well and what it does poorly, and how those two things affect the overall quality of the work as a whole. You could say that criticism is about stating what one thinks is the objective quality of a work of art, and is therefore subjective rather than objective. 
and to a degree that is true. However, a statement is not necessarily one or the other, since subjective and objective aren't mutually exclusive, though it is often useful to treat them as though they are. You can have a purely objective statement, such as, my desk is made of wood, and you can have a purely subjective statement, such as, cookie dough is my favorite flavor of ice cream. It's not a flavor! But you can also have a statement which is both objective and subjective in its nature, such as, I think Christianity is true. The statement is subjective because it is a statement about a belief I would have, but it is objective in the sense that it makes a truth claim. Because of this, an assessment of the facts will show it to be true or false, and the fact that it is also subjective does not make it a matter of personal taste. When someone says the word quality, they can be talking about almost any characteristic of a thing, normally as distinct from quantity. But that's not really what we mean when we're talking about a given work of art's quality. What we really mean is how good or bad it is. But then we ask, what does it mean for something to be good or bad in the first place? Well, I sure am glad that we asked that, because now I get to use the example of Jason the Squirrel. For Jason is a spectacular squirrel. Squirrels in general are great. They have a tail, a head, four legs, and fur. These are part of what it means to be a squirrel. So if a squirrel were to be missing one of these things, it would be worse in a real and qualitative sense. It would be a bad squirrel. And Jason is such an extraordinary squirrel because he not only has all these things, but also has squirrel vision which allows him to spot the nearest acorns and the most convenient route to get to them. Because of this, Jason not only functions as an ordinary squirrel and fulfills all the necessary purposes of an ordinary squirrel, he also exceeds them by a mile. Art also has this qualitative aspect, and by art it should be obvious that I'm not simply talking about the fine arts, like painting and sculpting and the like, but rather all forms of human craftsmanship. Just as good squirrel and bad squirrel are defined by the nature of squirreliness, so too the quality of a given work of art is defined by its nature, which comes from the art form, the genre, and the artist's intention. Take for example, a car. A car has all sorts of things that one can assess in order to examine its quality. It has an engine, doors, locks, wheels, gas and brake pedals, and many other things. And all of these things contribute in some way to either the effectiveness of driving or making the act of driving more comfortable. And so, a car with an efficient engine, user-friendly locks, air conditioning and heating, and good gas mileage will be a good car. Whereas if a car has a broken engine, one of the doors are missing, or it's a Chevy, then it will be a bad car because it will not fulfill the necessary function of a car. And so, if someone were to criticize these cars, they could judge them to either be good or bad, depending on how well they fulfill the purpose of a car. Before I can talk about the purpose of storytelling as opposed to car making or other arts, I'd like to distinguish between two categories, a broad purpose and a specific purpose. Now, before you ask, yes, I made up these categories for the purpose of this argument, but I think they work perfectly fine all the same. And this way, I will hopefully focus the discussion on the argument that I am making, rather than on a philosopher, or a literary critic, or, I don't know, a scholar that I am citing. None of those things are actually important to the discussion at hand, at least not in the immediate sense. And so I'd like to pull the discussion away from those sorts of things and simply talk about the conflicting ideas at hand. A broad purpose is what I mentioned earlier, the purpose that arises from the nature of the art form itself, such as a car's ability to drive. Whereas the specific purpose is the vision or intention given to a specific work of art within the context of the broad purpose, such as a car leaning more towards being comfortable rather than being fast or efficient. Thus, genre would also go under the classification of specific purpose, since it has more to do with the intention of the author rather than the art form itself. Now, I don't pretend to be well-read enough to explain the broad purpose of every form of art. Because of this, I will limit myself entirely to the art of storytelling, which has the broad purpose of teaching and entertaining. But to leave it here would be negligent, so let's delve into what teaching and entertaining mean in relation to the art of storytelling. Stories are a type of ordered experience. They're told through characters who experience events and generally they learn something because of the experience they had. And we get to learn from their experiences as well. Because of this, stories have the ability to teach us because they can test things like ideologies, sentiments, resolutions, or anything else that might be a part of our life. Stories have the ability to put those things through a trial. Having a character or characters believe them at the beginning of the story and letting the events that play out determine how true they are to them. 
Throughout this process, the story will explore the characters, allow us to get a feel for who they really are and what they really believe, until we come to know these characters as though they are real people, and this creates a sort of companionship between them and the viewer. Because of this, stories can also be entertaining. We enjoy the experience of companionship that stories often bring, and the way in which stories teach us is engrossing, so much so that it allows us to forget the cold, hard reality waiting for us on the other end of our door. It should be obvious here that when I say stories do this or stories do that, what I really mean is that good stories do this. Bad stories will often fail to teach anyone anything. So just as a squirrel can be judged as good or bad insofar as it fulfills and exercises the nature and purpose of squirreliness, so too a story can be judged as good or bad insofar as it fulfills the nature and purpose of storytelling. And just as a good squirrel is one with four legs and fur, a good story is one with a well-constructed plot, interesting characters, well-written dialogue, and properly explored themes, among other things. A bad story will have an incoherent plot, boring characters and dialogue, and or terrible world building, among other things. But on the other hand, you have Jason-level Squirrel, which exceeds the usual boundaries of squirrels. And so too, you have a story which exceeds the regular capacity of story, and truly ascends into the realm of legend, because it not only fulfills, but surpasses the usual purposes of teaching and entertaining. Alright, so now we're all in agreement about the nature of objectivity and subjectivity in relation to art and storytelling. Well, not quite. So there's a particularly flawed idea about media criticism that has gained a lot of popularity recently. It's the idea that we can judge art quote unquote objectively, a kind of criticism that focuses exclusively on things like plot holes and whether the events of a story make strict logical sense. So, you remember how at the beginning of the video I was talking about how I honestly don't believe anyone who has a channel about art criticism actually believes that criticism is subjective? Wait, you don't remember that? Was that from an earlier draft of the script? Well anyway, I honestly don't. And after watching Just Right's video, I feel utterly convinced in that assessment. That was Just Right. Though, I don't know why I'm the one introducing him. The disparity between our two YouTube accounts being... Understandably massive. Just Right has dedicated his channel to analyzing and critiquing art in an effort to help writers improve their writing. But Just Right also really likes The Last Jedi, a film littered with objective writing flaws that break immersion for several Star Wars fans. So how would he maintain his position as an art critic while also wanting to say that The Last Jedi is a good movie? Simple. Simply say that art criticism is subjective, rather than objective. Now, this is by no means the only video which has forwarded this idea, but it is probably the most egregious offender. It's an incoherent collection of non-sequiturs following an illegitimate appeal to authority and concluding with factually inaccurate information, all while not even attempting to understand or respond to what the actual opposing viewpoint is saying. Therefore, while I have neither the time nor the patience to exhaustively or even generally demonstrate the extent to which the subjectivist position exists on the internet, I can use an example of why the arguments for it simply do not work. So let's examine the arguments made throughout the video. The first is that Kant and Hume are really influential, and Kant says you can't judge art objectively. The second is that one cannot know the purpose of any given work of art. And finally, he says that there are more important things to a movie than plot holes or logical consistency. Everything else seems to just be fluff that either contributes to the incoherent nature of the video or simply doesn't need to be there. So which of these arguments do I have a problem with? Well, only all of them. First of all, for the 20 of you who know me in real life, you already know why I would think quoting Kant and Hume as authoritative figures is dubious at best. Just Right does mention how ancient and medieval philosophers represented by Plato and Augustine viewed beauty as an objective quality in the world, but he rejects their arguments for... reasons. Historically speaking, thinking that you can judge art objectively is not entirely unheard of. To many ancient and medieval thinkers, the idea of beauty being located in an object was a very popular position. It was as objectively true to say that a rose is red as to say that it is beautiful. And that is all the mention he makes of older philosophers. He doesn't even mention a single one of their arguments. And that is the second time that Just Right decides not to actually engage with the arguments of those of opposing viewpoints. The first time being the introduction, of course. And also a personal nitpick here, why is Augustine a medieval philosopher? Is he really dating the early 400s as the Middle Ages now? 
I'm the only one who cares about this, aren't I? Okay, moving on. He quotes Hume's idea of judgment, that beauty exists within the eye of the perceiver, and any truth claims about art come from good taste, which can be known through study and understanding of art that is considered good over time. Now, if by some stretch of the imagination I have a Humean scholar in my audience, he might be thinking, that's a terrible representation of Hume's idea of judgment. But it doesn't matter since Just Right entirely abandons Hume almost as fast as he brings him up and instead transitions immediately into Kant. Three categories. There's the agreeable, the beautiful, and the good. The main difference between them is based on which we desire. Let's say you're starving and a man offers you food. Because you need the food, you're in no position to judge how it tastes. You can only say that it is agreeable. Likewise, our judgments of what is good are also prejudiced by our desires. We want things that fulfill their function, so we say that they are good if they do. But when we look at something like a flower, we can call it beautiful because we don't need it for a specific purpose. It's an unbiased judgment. A piece of art is a little different than nature though, since we are constantly debating what the purpose of a piece of art is. A painting or a film doesn't serve an obvious practical function, and even if the author creates it for a specific purpose, art tends to take on a life of its own and can fulfill many unforeseen functions. And this is really important. If there's one idea I want you to take away from this video, it's this one. because. How can you establish the objective criteria for a piece of art when art doesn't serve a definitive, describable purpose? Like, you can say that a particular hammer is a good hammer because it is good at hammering nails, since hammering nails is the purpose of a hammer. But with art, the perceiver has to invent the purpose of whatever they're looking at. Is it to entertain, provoke thought, communicate a message, stir emotions, or nothing at all? With every piece of media you encounter, those questions are up for debate. So let's pretend for a moment that this was a perfect representation of Kant's philosophy of judgment. And let's also ignore the fact that Kant's philosophy of judgment is irrevocably tied to Kant's other metaphysical commitments, which I suppose only really academic Kantians would actually hold to. I'm instead going to simplify the matter by simply asking one question. Why should I accept this philosophy of judgment? Kant was indeed a great philosopher, and a smarter man than I will ever be, but he was not infallible, and much of what he wrote was based on assumptions that we now know are simply not true. This is often the case for a number of different thinkers in a variety of different subjects, whether they be literary criticism, metaphysics, epistemology, all sorts of philosophical topics. And because of that, if you wish to use a philosopher or his philosophy in support of your argument, you must do one of two things. You can demonstrate that it is an agreed-upon concept that is accepted across the board among all schools of thought, or at least most relevant schools of thought. An example of this would be if I were to cite the violation of Occam's razor as a response to someone's argument. Or, you can give an independent argument for why this philosophy or philosopher is right and the other ones are wrong. Just Right does neither of these, nor does he even attempt to refute the positions that disagree with his, as I mentioned earlier, so I feel no need to refute this section. So let's move on to the wonderful realm of purpose. But there is one more distinction to clear up, and it's between the beautiful and the good, and I think this one helps to explain the impossibility of objective critique. I said earlier that things that are good have a specific purpose, and we can say objectively whether or not they are good at achieving that purpose. The weird thing about things that are beautiful is that while they don't serve practical purposes, they feel like they do. So when we say that a flower is beautiful, we're not talking about the practical purpose it serves as the reproductive organ of a plant. What's beautiful about a flower is that it feels like it was designed to please, even though that is not its purpose. I actually really like this section of the video, since Just Right, even arguing from a subjectivist position, does agree that if something has a purpose, then it can be judged by the metric of, does it fulfill that purpose? He simply denies that art has a purpose. I have a number of problems with this. First, he admits that some forms of art do have a purpose, such as a hammer's ability to hammer nails, and that the hammer which is good at hammering nails is a good hammer, which means that some art forms do have objective qualities. So what he seems to be trying to make is a distinction between practical art, or art forms that produce something which will make someone's life easier, with speculative art forms, which do not. But this distinction seems rather arbitrary. Which leads to my second problem. What he's saying here is wrong. All forms of speculative art throughout history have served definable purposes. 
such as the decoration of temples or churches, or the adorning of public buildings as a display of glory and prestige. But as I've argued throughout this video, this is especially the case with storytelling. All speculative art forms have what I've referred to as broad and specific purposes, whether that art form be painting, storytelling, or even criticism. Because yes, that's right, criticism is also an art form, and a speculative art form at that. And given that, doesn't it make it a little... Ironic, when a defender of subjectivity considers some criticism to be worse because it attempts to be objective rather than recognize that criticism is subjective in nature. But who knows, maybe objective criticism is only subjectively worse. But anyway, I digress. His argument that people can find meaning in art beyond what the original author intended is a moot point at best. It has no more impact on the broad and specific purposes of the art form than someone using a wine glass as a cigarette holder. The fact that someone has found another use or purpose for the wine glass doesn't change the fact that it was originally intended to hold and make the drinking of wine more easy. For the last part of this section, I'd like to talk about how he caps off this part of the argument because I find it to be rather interesting. So, whenever we critique the quality of art, we first make an arbitrary assumption about what its purpose is, then we invent criteria to decide whether that purpose is achieved, and it's only after that that the analysis proceeds logically. However, this notion that goodness is tied to arbitrary assumptions, as well as the rest of the video, is undermined almost immediately by one single line. Artists are constantly faced with these kinds of trade-offs, where they can choose to sacrifice the logic of a scene to a degree in order to improve other qualities of the film. So, I have a question. What does improve mean in this context? I know that what he is saying is that a movie will do some things well and other things poorly, and whether or not that makes it good or bad will be determined subjectively by those who watch it. But that's the thing. A movie will do things well or poorly. Those aren't subjective terms. They are objective qualities. Otherwise, the very notion of improvement becomes unintelligible. You can say that someone might value the things a film does well more than they value the things it does poorly, and that this is where the idea of a movie being good or bad come from. But that would again be to confuse the nature of subjectivity and objectivity, which is why I clarified those terms at the very beginning of the video. And even then, you're still admitting that movies have objective qualities the very second you start talking about improvement of any sort. That one line determined that this would be the video I would respond to. Because it, more than anything else on the internet that I've been able to find, has exemplified why it is impossible to hold a subjectivist position as a critic. And now we finally move on to the third point. And for this one, I don't feel like playing the whole thing since it would be too long, so instead I'm going to summarize the premises here. If anyone feels I've misrepresented his argument, then feel free to call me out on it and I'll be sure to make a mention of it in the next video. The general point is that there are more important things to a movie than logical consistency. He supports this argument by saying that the original cut of Star Wars was terrible, and so the editor made it better by removing some of the logical consistency in order to add tension. He then concludes his argument by saying that The Dark Knight, a movie which everyone holds up on a pedestal, has more plot holes than any movie you can name. There are so many problems with this argument. I will talk about three of them. First, no one argues that objective criticism is entirely about the logical consistency of the plot or an assessment of plot holes. This has for some reason been just Wright's definition of what objective criticism means. Objective doesn't mean logical, objective means apart from perception. And this is why an assessment of character writing, world building, and many other factors go into what I would refer to as objective reviews. Second. The final product of Star Wars still makes sense as a story. One can perhaps forgive a slight logical inconsistency that doesn't make total 100% sense because the story still functions as a narrative. That one flaw by itself does not make the original Star Wars a bad movie. But this also doesn't support his argument, because that logical inconsistency is still a flaw with the original Star Wars movie, and that affects the overall quality, such that it would have been better if the editor found a way to add tension without sacrificing the movie's other qualities. And finally, Just Right accidentally proves this last point with his example of The Dark Knight. 
Because, first off, the notion that the Dark Knight has more plot holes than any other movie you can name is one of the most ridiculous notions ever put on the internet. As competitive a placement as that might be. This is not only manifestly untrue if you've watched anywhere near the amount of movies that Just Right has made videos about, it's untrue if you've simply watched the Dark Knight trilogy. The Dark Knight, by any metric, has both fewer and less egregious plot holes than its sequel, The Dark Knight Rises. Guess which film is unanimously considered better? That's right, it's the one with fewer plot holes. Guess what is normally the reason for why it is considered better? It's because the story makes more sense. The stakes and drama are set up better and because of that, the logical consistency of the movie contributes to the tension. Now obviously that was not an exhaustive breakdown of everything wrong with that video, or even everything wrong with the arguments and clips that I referenced. I do however think that this analysis and the rest of my video have done a good job of proving the point I was trying to make. But either way, I'd like to close this video by clarifying a few things. While deciding on which video I should respond to while writing this script, I read a great number of comments which I found useful as a way to understand the sentiments behind the position I am arguing against. So I'd like to say, first, that I am not saying you can't enjoy bad art, nor am I saying that bad art cannot be valued. What I am saying is that art is either good or bad, or somewhere in between, and that when we make art, we should attempt to make good art. As you can see, my artistic talent as pertaining to drawing is mediocre at best and bad at worst, but it would be wrong for me to settle for just this, and it would be wrong for others to say that this is good art. I should try to improve my drawing abilities through practice and study, because good art is worth it. Because art, and storytelling in particular, is about more than just the simple enjoyment of the product. Stories can be our greatest teachers. They can pass on or critique our traditions and beliefs, and they can reveal things about us that we never even knew were there. And good stories can serve as better teachers, better preserve or critique our traditions and beliefs, can be more readily and fruitfully studied, and can reveal more about ourselves than bad stories can. The other thing I wanted to clarify is that I am not at all saying that it is easy to reach the right conclusion of a given work of art's quality, just because I believe that there is a definite quality, and that it is objective. This is why discussions of quality are just that, discussions. Multiple points of view are needed in order to get to the truth of the matter about how good a given work of art is, and this is the case with all other forms of human study as well. Because make no mistake, the fact that I believe that our criticism is objective does not mean that I think I am infallible. There are probably at least 30 mistakes in this video alone. But just as it would be wrong to refuse to point out the objective mistakes someone makes in their argumentation, so too it would be wrong to refuse to point out the mistakes an artist makes. And we can discuss whether or not something is good or bad if we're in the realm of objectivity. But if you reduce all discussion to the realm of subjectivity, you have removed the discussion entirely. Now, as it happens, I like discussing art, and my whole purpose for doing this on Secret's channel is to refine the discussions about art. Society as a whole has suffered from a lack of understanding of both how to create art and how to think about it, and so I submit this as the first part of my series in hopes that I can help resolve this problem. This, in fact, leads me to my next point, but I'll get to that in my next video. Thank you all. If any of you have actually stayed through the entire video, I hope you found it both insightful and entertaining. I'll see you for the next one.